Well, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 4, the last two verses. We're looking at the spectrum of worship this morning. And we've, we looked last week at the far end of the spectrum, the unacceptable worship or the worship that God rejects, that he does not receive. And, and that is the, the far end and the bad end of the spectrum. The other end is where we're going this morning. This is the, the absolute perfect enshrined in the pages of scripture and being offered before the throne of God, worship that is pleasing and acceptable to him. And what we're going to look at is this. Now, I want you to think about this. Most of us are very cautious what we allow people to see. I mean, the younger people are, the more when you take a picture, they go, you're not going to post that, are you? You know, I mean, it's, we're, we like to manage what people see in our lives. In fact, some people won't answer the door if they don't look a certain way. And, and it, it's just, it's very much a part of us that we want people to see what we want them to see. Did you ever think about the fact that the pictures that are placed in the Bible were intentionally placed there by the Lord? He wants us to see something. And these two verses, the last two verses of chapter 4, are like a video clip that the Lord inserts. And what we see is, now think about this, this is the first time we see someone that's made it to heaven. I mean, aren't all of us longing and hoping for the, the fulfillment of, of our salvation at last, as David said, to see him face to face and be like him? Well, what does the first person posted in God's picture book of heaven, what do we see with the first Christian born again person in heaven? We see them doing something that God wants to have on our minds. Now remember, the whole book of Revelation was written by God, not because he needs to know what's going on up there, not because he needed to do it, but because he wanted to give it to us, Christ's servants, so that we would know where we're headed, the currency of heaven, how to do what pleases God, what lasts forever and, and is before God's presence, so that we could make conscious choices here to synchronize our lives with what we see pleasing, glorifying, honoring, and magnifying him up there. So what are they doing? We see the, the 24 elders as they bow. They bow so low, they fall on their faces. They fall on their faces, and as they, they bow before him, they take from their heads, we'll see in verse 4, crowns of gold. And those, by the way, how do you get a crown of gold in heaven? Does God sell them? Do certain people afford them and other people don't? You see, that's, that's why he wrote this book. There is a way to have a crown. And, and there is a process that's going to determine what is gold for that crown. And we've studied all First 1 Corinthians 3.10. All of that is in the Bible. It's the judgment seat of Christ. And, and our whole lives are going to be put in the basket and run through the blast furnace. And anything that survives the fire that refines out unsanctified, fleshly, unprompted by the spirit parts of our life, that all burns up. But what's left is that gold and silver and precious stones. And so think about what we're seeing. It's intentional. The first glimpse of believers by the God of the universe, bowing in submission, uh, by their very body language, showing surrender, by their, their act of casting the crown, saying it's not about us, it's all about you. That's the first time we show up in the book of Revelation in heaven. And it's, it's a marvelous thought. Well, last time we looked at what makes our worship unacceptable. This week we look at what always makes our worship acceptable and pleasing to God. Now, I, I want you to think about the 24 with me before we read about it. Because as we read verses 10 and 11, I want you to think about what you're looking at as you see a picture of 24 elders. Most likely, each of these 24 men seated on the inner circle of the throne are former, imperfect, forgiven sinners. Now, I acknowledge you know, there are a lot of books written on Revelation, and I have 130 of them. 
commentaries on Revelation. And there is a section of commentators that say, these are not people. These are like, you know, the seven columns of fire and they're like the eye-covered cherubim. These are representative beings. They're not people. I go, okay, that's a view. I don't agree with it for many reasons, but I acknowledge that. But since that's probably wrong, these are people. <laughs> and these are people wearing white robes that have been cleansed. I mean, you don't, you don't see the cherubim needing cleansing because they are perfected in his glory. They were not former imperfect human beings. But when you see them, think about if they're humans, what they used to be. They used to be imperfect sinners. They each had to be saved by grace. Each of them went through life being cleansed every day by the sacrifice of Christ. You say, were people in the Old Testament cleansed by the sacrifice of Christ? Yes, they were. Do you know how we know that? The last verse of Hebrews 11 says that they, Old Testament saints, without us, New Testament saints, could not be perfected. All of us are perfected by one sacrifice that was forever the atoning sacrifice for the sin of the world, Jesus Christ. They look forward to it. We look back in faith upon it. Both are operations of faith. But as they confessed and forsook their sins going through life, they also were cleansed, just like we are. And so these 24 elders represent former imperfect sinners, each saved by grace, each cleansed each day by the sacrifice of Christ, each of them glorified at the moment of their death. Do you remember what happens the instant we're saved? We, we have a position in perfection and glory, but we sure don't live it out here on earth. And the progressive sanctification is us more and more being surrendered to the Lord, but we're never perfected till we get to heaven. Don't ever forget that. That it's not till heaven that we're glorified. You know what glorification means? It means not only is the penalty of sin gone, not only is the, the power of sin broken in our life, but the presence of sin is forever removed. We never will have the capacity when we're glorified to sin. And what a, that's what a lot of the hymns are about. Uh, the, the glorious day when we awaken in his likeness and when we are forever undistracted, forever praising and worship and glorifying him. But these 24, at the moment of their death, were glorified and now they're in heaven and they're offering perfect worship. Now, I want you to think about that. That they, former imperfect ones, are now offering perfect worship. Do you catch that profound truth? Each servant of God that we will ever find in heaven was once an imperfect servant of God the entire time they lived on earth. So I call this truth number one, okay? Think, let this sink in. All believers in every time period, every dispensation, every era of the Bible, all believers in every time period have always been imperfect all through their lives. You know, sometimes we don't really, I mean, we know that, but we don't really believe that. I mean, we think that some of these people we read their biographies that just went out to the jungles or to the deserts, that they were perfect. Or we think about someone that, that's in the Bible, that, that, that lived this stellar life on the pages of Scripture, was somehow perfect. Did you know Paul said, I've never attained he wrote half of the New Testament. He got to go to heaven and see it. By the way, when he went to heaven and saw it, he didn't write about it. He said, it's, it's, I can't write it down. It's interesting, everybody else since that's gone to heaven purportedly writes about it, you know? Paul couldn't, uh, but I'm not on that topic of all those interesting books. But Paul said, I haven't attained, I'm not perfect. I'm following after, if that I may apprehend in heaven, the reason for which I was apprehended by Christ. Nobody is perfect. One of the most amazing truths of God's word is that God accepts and uses imperfect people. In fact, the simplest and most accurate description of the apostles would be 12 imperfect men. And that's not usually what we think about, but that's who God uses. The simplest and most accurate description of John, Paul, Peter, Noah, Daniel, Moses, Hannah, and even Mary would be they were each imperfect servants. Imperfect. Never, never perfect. The same could be said for every servant, every saint, 
And especially the same could be said for every Christian home. You know, I'm going to send out, uh, I hope, Monday or Tuesday in the E! News a little note asking you to pray because once every three years I get I had an incredible privilege. Once every three years, this mission board invites back every one of their Christian leaders of every one of the mission fields of the world. 65 countries are represented, and each of these people that come are over the church planning, the church translation, the evangelism, the, you know, every nurturing thing outside the United States in 65 countries. The, the actual leaders of all these ministries come. And they, every three years, this, these wealthy foundations, fly them all back from every corner of the world, take them to a retreat center, and, and just feed them and rest them, and then allow them to have this kind of Bible conference setting with targeted messages. You know, they asked me to come and to speak on the imperfect family, and the imperfect marriage, and the imperfect ministry. Do you know why? Because they're out there on the cutting edge. They're on the forefront. They're on the, the worst and most difficult venues for the gospel in the world. And they labor under the thought that because they're in such a critical place, they've got to have perfect children. They've got to have a perfect marriage. They've got to have a perfect everything, ministry. And you know what? The best description of the Christian home is the imperfect home. The best description of a Christian marriage is an imperfect marriage. Why? Because you have two imperfect people. And that's the kind of people that the Lord uses. The same could be said for everything that we do. The simplest and most accurate description of all we are and do is that we are imperfect. But that brings us to truth number two. Imperfect saints that are surrendered can offer worship that God treasures and rewards. See, that's what the blessing is. You don't have to arrive at some rarefied state to offer worship that pleases God, that he treasures, and that he will reward us for. Because imperfect saints that are surrendered. Now, now I want, I'm, I'm kind of underlining this in your mind. Why do you think God lets us see the 24 elders doing that face down obeisance? Why do we see them constantly getting up and bowing and face down and, and casting those crowns? In fact, if I was, uh, you ever do charades? You know, we used to have biblical charades in our family, you know, and, and uh, you know, like, I mean, that's David and Goliath, you know, and they, oh, you know, and they get a cookie, you know. And, and you remember, the, the, if I was doing a biblical charade for the last two verses, and, and, and I fell down and acted like I was taking a crown and I was laying it somewhere, I would be portraying surrendered. Why? Why is that in there? Because God is saying, are you paying attention? That's the key to having your worship rise before me. Because imperfect saints that are surrendered can offer worship that God treasures and rewards. A surrendered believer doesn't think they're perfect, but the instant that they stray, the instant that they at all fall short of God's glory in any area of their life, they're consciously, painfully aware of it, and they confess their sins, and that glorifies him. Do you remember before they stoned Achan? Do you remember that in Joshua 7? Achan, the one that stole the, the fancy clothes and the gold wedge and buried it in his tent? Come on, you're living in a tent, you dig a great big hole in the middle of it, everybody knew he was doing something that lived in the tent, but no one told on him. And so they all get dragged out and they're gonna be stoned to death. But before the nation of Israel stones the whole family and their animals, and they burned the whole pile when they got done killing them, before they did it, do you remember what Joshua said to Achan? He said, glorify God by confessing your sin. You know what that tells us? God is even glorified as we acknowledge our failures. Imperfect saints that are surrendered can offer worship that God treasures and rewards if they're surrendered. So what is it that makes what we do acceptable and pleasing in God's sight? What makes it last, kind of like what we see in Revelation 4? What makes it golden like those crowns in heaven? What makes it eternal? I mean, it's in heaven. Anything in heaven is eternal. What made it that way? Surrender. And that's what they're portraying as they fall, bowing, taking the crowns off. 
in the verses we have before us, we see beautifully portrayed the submission that God delights in. The submission that is so precious and and so pleasing to God that he wants it going on constantly at his feet, surrounding him. Remember, these guys surround the throne. They're the inner circle, and all they're doing is doing a pantomime of surrender, a, a picture, a video clip of worship. The elders who were formerly imperfect earthly saints do a visual as they worship in heaven, as they humbly fall on their faces, as they bow submissively before Christ as their king, as they offer their worship, as they lay their crowns at his feet. They humbly fall on their faces in heaven because they had humbly worshiped on earth. Don't don't miss the connection. You're not going to be someday what you're not right now becoming. Some people are like Balaam. Do you remember Balaam in the Old Testament? Balaam of of Beor. uh, He said, let me die the death of the righteous. He just didn't want to live the life of the righteous. And you can't do that. You can't die the death of the righteous if you don't live the life of the righteous. You will never offer perfected worship in heaven if you don't offer it on earth. See, the the Lord says, you got to see the connection. They submissively bow in heaven because they had already submissively bowed on earth. They they offer golden crowns in heaven because God declares their worship on earth was tested as they offered it, and it was received and found to be like gold. That, That is such a thrill to think about. Remember, what God has already told us in 1 Corinthians 3.10 is that all of our good works will go through the fires of refinement to see which of them It's it's only our good works that go in there. But the ones that were offered with the proper motivation, the proper prompting, the proper energizing by the Spirit, and the proper focus on God, and the proper sanctified, consecrated surrender and submission, those make it through the fire. And only God can test that. And only we can offer that. Well, as we open to Revelation 4.10, we're looking at what is most well-known aspect of worship in heaven. But we're not just looking at what they do, but we're looking at what it is they're giving. And they're giving that golden crown, that picture of surrender that worship always is to be. Let's all stand together for reading, and we'll read uh, 10, 11 of chapter 4, and then we're going to flip back and read verse 4. So we're kind of reading backward this morning, but follow along. Revelation 4.10 with me, please. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Now slip up to verse four, same chapter. And around the throne were 24 thrones And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Wow. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that your word, uh, the message, the truth, the, the purpose this video clip was enclosed right here where it is, and the content of it would be taken by your spirit to stir our hearts that that in every choice we make, in every moment we consciously can choose what we do and how we are, that we would choose and be humbly surrendered, bowing, bowing at work, bowing at school, bowing as we are alone, bowing when we're in public, in our heart of hearts, that you would see this type of a life of worship and that this picture would just get burned into our hearts and minds that this would be what prompts and motivates us because that's where we're headed and that's what we want to give and we'll never be what we're not right now becoming and we know we become it by your grace and we know it's it's reflective of the choices we make but those choices can only be energized by your spirit and that's what we ask for as we look into your word Speak to our hearts and change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And I want you to think about 
what John thought about as he wrote this. Do you remember, John was a real person. We forget sometimes that, that we're all real people. Yesterday I was at the men's retreat and one of the men came up to me and said, he says, you know, a lot of us think that, that you're, really, you're really wired for the Lord. I thought, where is this going, you know? And, and he says, you know, we, we, we aren't like you. And I says, well, there's some truth in what you're saying. I says, what do you do? And he told me what he did. I said, I could never do that my whole life. I could never. I mean, I don't even, I don't even know where the water goes in the lawnmower. I mean, I am so non-mechanical. <laughs> I have no mechanical abilities. I stopped typing because I couldn't with 10 fingers. I use two. I can independently do this, but this idea of looking in one direction, doing something the other, I had to stop piano lessons because you know, I don't have any of those skills and talents. I said, I could never do what you do. And I said, you probably don't know anything about syntactical studies and morphology of, of Greek and Hebrew words. But I said, that's probably the only difference between us. Everything else in our lives, in the Apostle John's lives, and all the galaxy of superheroes in the Bible, the only difference is not it, that they were any different than us. It was the fact that we all equally, if we're saved, have all of God, because he doesn't give his spirit by measure. But God has differing amounts of us. So if there's any difference between us sitting in this room today, it's how much of us God possesses, controls and how much of us is totally yielded to him? How much of our lives fall before him? Now, think about the, the thought that John has as he wrote this. He's looking at this scene of these elders kneeling, casting crowns before the throne of God. And, and in his mind, because he lived in the Roman Empire, there was a picture that came to him. That brings us to the third truth. The 24 elders casting their crowns portray their surrendered lives as they offered worship to God. Now, that's key. They didn't, in heaven, offer worship to God because they were forced to do it. And, and we can't on earth either. God doesn't accept that kind. That's why we have to be so cautious about forcing people to do things that they haven't yet chosen to do. You know, a lot of times... A lot of parents kind of, kind of force along the kids. They want them to do all this stuff. Wait until God is at work in their heart. That's what he wants. He wants to prompt this. But this truth is, listen, the 24 elders, this whole picture, this video clip of casting their crowns portray their surrendered lives as they offer worship to God in heaven. But you know what? It's reflective of what our lives are supposed to be like on earth. Now, what did John think when he wrote this? Often our distance from the history of the past can lessen the impact of some of the images in the Bible. To us, it's just wonderful, you know, that those elders are, are uh, representing us, get to worship in such a beautiful way. But did you know John had a different picture in his mind? Do you know why? Because something happened in his lifetime that everyone in the Roman Empire knew about. You know, Rome was a huge empire. It stretched from Britain to northern Africa, way up to what we would call the steppes of Russia. You know, they conquered up over in the Black Sea area, all the way into the Middle East to Parthia and toward India. It was a big place. And the way that they unified it is, the emperor would have certain things that would be repeated in every town. And, and a lot of times they would make plays or theatrical things out of them with a message, and the government would pay to have all that stuff Done, and people would say, what is it about? And it would be explained, and it was so picturesque that they would remember it. Well, Nero, you know Nero, the one that killed Peter and Paul, the one that, that, that persecuted and burnt to death and, and horribly massacred the Christians in Rome. He committed suicide in about 68, late 68 AD. In 66, 67 AD, he hosted the single largest outlay of money Rome ever had. The Roman treasury, they used to keep track of their sestestories or whatever their money was called back then, their outlays. And, and the historians say that what Nero did in 60, late 60s, early 67 was the single most expensive thing the Roman government ever did their whole time. And what he did is he invited 
the subjugated nation of Parthia, their prince, his name was Tiratites, he invited him to come with his whole retinue, and he came with all the people, and kind of like the Queen of Sheba, too. And they all came tromping to Rome, and Nero paid for it. And he came to the forum that's still there today. Nero was sitting on his, his emperor's seat, and he had the great crown of Rome on his head, and he was sitting there, and this Tiratides, the Parthian prince, came before him and, and got on his knees with all of the hosts around him, And Nero took a crown that was sitting on a little pillow, lifted it up, and with this guy kneeling at his feet, he put the crown on this guy's head. Now, this was all orchestrated, you know, how Nero was. And this guy stood up with the crown on his head, took it off, fell with his face on Nero's feet, and handed him the crown. He said, you are my God. Oh, the the forum erupted. People just cheered, and Nero made a play out of this and funded it with someone playing him and someone playing the Parthian and all the things. And they went to every part of the empire and said, this is how strong our emperor Nero is, that everyone bows and calls him God. John, I'm sure, saw that play. Because everybody in the Roman Empire, it was played over and over. But you know what everybody that saw it knew? They knew that Tiridates knew that the Praetorian Guard had their razor-sharp swords, and if he even blinked the wrong way, this would have had a very messy ending. Because he was forced to come. He was forced to kneel. He was forced to to take the crown back off and to lay down at Nero's feet. You know what John thought about as he wrote this? He said, we do it because we love him, because he saved us. That's what chapter 5 is about. can't wait till we get there. Do you know what they're all talking about? The Redeemer. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own son, and how thankful we are. Well, John said, the 24 elders casting their crowns portray their surrendered lives. They were not forced. They were not acting. They were not portraying something. It was, it was real. They were submissive. They responded in surrender and humility. Always remember how God loves that type of, of chosen submission and humility. Do you remember the worst king Israel ever had? Do y'all remember from Sunday school? King Ahab, what was his wife's name? Yeah, Jezebel. I mean, you ever want to not compliment someone, say, you're a real Jezebel, you know? I mean, so she was the wickedest woman involved in all kinds of immorality. Their little temples, their little Baal shrines and Asherah places were involved with male and female shrine prostitutes, all engaged in aberrant homosexual and lesbian behavior. And, and, and Ahab and Jezebel were just, couldn't get enough of that stuff. They were just vile. And finally, they killed one too many innocent people and, and everything. And so finally, God sent word to Ahab that, that he was going to die and the dogs were going to drink his blood. That doesn't sound very good. And uh, so Ahab, when he got the message, tore his clothes, put on sackcloth. And it says in the Bible, he walked softly through his palace. In other words, he wouldn't look up and you just kind of, just walk kind of numb in this, this torn clothes, sackcloth, humble thing. You know what the Bible says? God said, he was on his throne, he says, look, look how Ahab humbles himself. I'm not going to send that trouble on him right away. Look how he humbled himself. You see, God, even to a vile wicked, murderous, sexually deviant person, any humble contrition, he responds to it. You see, God loves submission. He loves humility and surrender. And when we're not acting, and when we're actually casting our lives at his feet, portraying absolute surrender to him and adoration of him, he responds to it. Now, now what does surrender mean? I, I looked it up in the dictionary. 
Surrender means to yield the power and control and possession to someone else. It, it, it says to become their prisoner, to give up and, and yield to the power of another. In fact, the synonym of surrender is yield. You know what God loves? Surrender, yielding, submission. And he responds to it. Surrender is the key to true worship that God accepts. Remember last week we looked at this end of the spectrum, what God rejects? Do you know what he, what he accepts? Surrender. Surrender to his will, to his word, to his description. A life surrendered to God is moving along in the process of sanctification, the Bible says. That's described as a life that's yielded, that's consecrated, that's dedicated, that's spirit-filled. Unsurrendered lives are unsanctified. The Bible calls them carnal and fleshly, and, and they quench the Holy Spirit. But a surrendered life, a surrendered life, it, it, it's not, you know, there's this idea that, okay, I already have done that. Have you ever heard someone say that? I've done that. Really? You know, that, that's kind of like parking on the, the side of a slippery slope. I remember once I took my company car. I used to be a drug salesman. I went to Mahogany Flats. If you ever know what it is, it's in Death Valley. And, you know, I was supposed to visit a drugstore out there somewhere. So I thought, I, I'm going to go to the top of Mahogany Flats. Oh, you shouldn't do that. It's on about a, I don't know what incline that would be, but it is that incline. And I was driving that company car up until I realized my tires were spinning. And finally, I realized even with my foot to the floorboard and the tires spinning, I was going back down the mountain. It was too steep an angle for a, for a not, non four wheel drive off road vehicle to go on. And as I slid thousands of feet back down to Death Valley, I would see signs saying, no passenger cars, only off-road four-wheel. And I realized you cannot climb that steep incline in a car. Did you know that we cannot, if we are not in the power of the Spirit, denying the flesh, we cannot live a sanctified life. And, and as we try in our own strength, we're just sliding back into sin. But did you know what a surrendered person does? Instead of letting their car go down, they let the Lord pull them up. And that's the power of grace that, that is operative in our life. But we have to make that choice. Either surrender, which is pleasing God, or unsurrender, which is pleasing self. Either allowing him to sanctify us, that's like pulling us up the hill, or resisting his sanctification. You know, if, if I would have had, had, had any ability in my own strength to be holy, then, then the Lord would allow me to fall flat on my face because he says, apart from me, I want you to know you can do nothing. I want you to surrender and be sanctified so you can offer acceptable worship. That's called spirit-filled walking. Spiritually-minded worship is acceptable, but fleshly-minded, spirit-quenching, resisting sanctification worship the Lord doesn't accept. So here's the last truth, number four. We can worship God as we surrender our lives to him every day. Now, go back to where we ended last week. Uh, go to Revelation, or, I mean, uh, Romans chapter 12. In first service, I said, wow, it seems like 168 hours just went like that. I remember saying, go to Revel or Romans chapter 12 last week. And a week has gone by, but let's go back there. Just before we go, I want to show you one thing. We can worship God as we surrender our lives to him each day. You understand that? Romans 12 presents the actual act of surrender. And this is what Paul says, I beseech you therefore, verse 1 of chapter 12 of Romans, I beseech you therefore, brethren, because of the merciful God that he is. That's all those chapters of the doctrine of salvation and imputation and justification and all that he did. I beseech you that you present your body. You know what that is? That's the surrender element that pleases God. That's what God wants. He wants us, you know, if God has your body, he has everything. Have you ever read about these people, you know, they go off on these exotic, going to a 12-star hotel, you know, in, in Wong Hong somewhere, and they drink the water and poof, they get Montezuma's revenge. They don't remember anything about the trip. The food doesn't taste good to them. They won't even look out the window. They're parked in the bathroom, you know. And, and you know why? Their body, their body is not cooperating. Their body is not with what's going on. Did you know what the Lord says? You, you want to be with what's going on? I have to have your body surrendered. Because if your body is, is surrendered as an instrument of righteousness, 
If your body is, look what it says. If it's a living sacrifice, if, if you allow me to, to make you holy, what is holy? Does that mean, you know, it reminds me of one of my teachers. She used to have a bun and, and it pulled her face back. And, you know, she was like this, you know. She had such a tight bun. Does it mean that? that that's kind of this, this no. It's, it's surrendered completely to his control. That's what he wants our body to be. And you know what? We don't stay that way. And so he's glorified every time we say, I'm no longer surrendered. I want to give myself back to you. That's why Paul says, I beg you, I beseech you, give your body back. It's your reasonable service. It's your act of spiritual worship. Now look at verse 2. How do you keep surrendered? How do you keep living sacrificed living? Verse 2. By not being conformed to this world. We're always on the lookout. You know, we lived, I pastored in the East Coast, and they used to have all these boats that were out in the ocean. You know what they, the, the people that cared about their boat did? They were always taking them out of the water, putting them up in these, these special places, and getting the barnacles scraped off of them. Why? What's a barnacle? It's a little creature that grows, and then it ex- exudes this uh, kind of shell stuff, and it just builds up like a coral reef on the hull of the ship. And it, it resists the ship going through water. And so they would regularly park their big boats in and, and dry dock, and they'd scrape, and they'd sandblast, and they'd paint until they were slipping right through the water. You know what the Lord says? Check often for the barnacles of the world that just going through the world, the barnacles attach to us. And we have to say, I don't want that. I don't want to be conformed to the world and, and displeasing you in that area. And what's the other half of it? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what you find out? If you don't drive your boat through certain waters, you don't get as many barnacles. You catch that? That's what renewing your mind. You realize that if you're entertained by sin, then sin starts attaching itself more readily. And so he says, I just want you to get in the process. Give me your body. Surrender to me. Let me scrape off the barnacles and transform your mind so that you can live offering worship. Look at the end of the verse. It's good and acceptable and perfect. So how do we do that? We do that by remembering the picture we started with. 24 elders showing absolute surrender and submission, falling before the Lord. That's what God is looking for in our lives. So what we're going to do is, uh, can you put that slide up? Uh, this, there before you is a, a song we're going to sing. You all know it. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. I want you to read this with me in a moment. In fact, let's stand as we, we're going right into communion by preparing here. And I want you, we're going to read these words. And then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing these words. But somewhere between right now the reading and when we get to the singing, say, Lord, you who, I have all of you, you moved in, all of you, God, I possess. I'm the very temple of the living God, but Lord, there's some parts of me that you don't have. And this morning at this communion, I want to offer some of that golden eternal worship. Because I consciously, willfully, by choice, not because the Praetorian has got their knife at my throat, but because I love you, I want to offer, unlock every door of my life and say, Lord, just go through there, and if there's something you want to clean out, clean it out. You know, Bonnie's in Boston, and so I'm alone with the kids, and the kids were going, Dad, have you emptied the trash lately? It stinks around here. I said, I don't have, I'm studying, you know? I don't have time to empty the trash. Did you know we let the Lord come around our lives and go, you need to empty that. That's what surrender is. So let's read these words and then let's sing and do that to the Lord. Together, we fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Let's bow. Father, I pray that your spirit would empower us to not go through charades, motions, 
acts. But may we truly, as we sing to you, from our hearts be saying, we're bowing, we're surrendering. Take more of our lives than you've ever had before. Conquer back areas we have robbed you of in our lives, our time, our schedule, our attention, whatever it is. Scrape the barnacles off that displease you with our whole hearts. We want to commune with you. Inhabit the song of surrender, we pray, Lord Jesus, in your precious name, amen. Let's sing this to the Lord as the men prepare to serve us. The bread we hold in our hands is a picture of the price Jesus paid. Paul said you're bought at a price, the highest price possible. And the highest price paid for an object means that the object is very treasured. Our value is not in ourselves, but in the price that was paid for us. And therefore, as that purchased object, we get to reflect back how much we appreciate the purchaser. And that reflection is called surrender. He bought us, so we're useful to him. So we say, I want to resist less and less. I want to surrender more and more. That's what coming under the hearing of the word of God is to do to us. That's what the memorization of scripture is to do to us. That's what the study of the Bible does. We just find more and more parts of our life that we want the Lord to invade. And so Jesus said, this is my body given to purchase us. This do remembering me. Let's partake together. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege of having our hope in you who gave yourself for us. And that giving of yourself was most portrayed by the, the blood that gushed from your body as you poured out your life in your blood. And that blood that sealed our pardon is the blood of the new covenant that promises that you are able not only to keep us from falling, but to present us faultless because you'll just keep cleansing and cleansing and cleansing us imperfect servants. You are glorified as we confess our weaknesses and our failures, our sins, our wanderings. And you're glorified as we surrender more and more. Thank you for this cup. Thank you for the new covenant that it portrays. And may we reflect even more of your control of our lives today. And in the days ahead, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. This next hymn, my hope is in the Lord. And then the next line is Paul's testimony. He gave himself for me. Let's worship the Lord as we sing this to him. We need to read the words because this is Jesus' high priestly mediatorial work on our behalf. Because we do still fail him. We do still sin. And so the scriptures tell us, he ever lives to intercede for us. So let's say these words just before we sing the next stanza. And now for me he stands before the Father's throne. He shows his wounded hands and names me as his own. For me he died. For me he lives. And everlasting life and light. He freely gives. Let's stand and we'll sing the last stanza gloriously to him. The only thing that would top that is if we didn't have pews, we could all just fall down, right? I mean, isn't that neat? I said that once in Tulsa, and one of our 75-year-olds, I saw him go down, and I was hoping it was under their own volition. And uh, they actually did. White-haired fellow in the balcony, he said, if they're doing it in heaven, I'm going to do it now. And he just got down, laid down on the floor, and I thought, wow, you know, we're used to talking about this. And he just said, ah, enough talking, I want to do it. But Jesus said, this is a new covenant that's in my blood. This is the picture that I gave myself for you, that I redeemed you. Drink from it, all of you. Let's partake together. Lord Jesus, as we have the contents of this cup within us. May it be a reminder that you live within us 
And you want all of us under your gracious lordship. May we surrender a bit more today. May we read your word looking for more ways to give in, to give up, to turn over to you. And may our lives more and more reflect the sweetness that we have cast ourselves in humble submission at your feet. Receive our worship. Thank you for loving us. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and all of God's servants said, amen. God bless you as you go.